Welcome back to our Systematic Theology session. This is actually part seven of sanctification. This is soteriology, the doctrine of salvation, and in particular, the facet of sanctification. Okay? Sanctification, may I remind you, is the process of growing more and more away from sin, being separated from sin, being separated by God. We, the believers, are being separated by God unto himself and away from sin and allowing us and uh, making us to grow more and more into the image of his dear Son, the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And as God is my witness, I think I have stayed pretty constantly and consistently in referring to these items as facets of the beautiful diamond of salvation. And we left off last Lord's Day evening with Philippians 2.12. And so I ask you to turn there now. Philippians 2.12, that's where we will start tonight. Here in Philippians 2.12, what you'll read as salvation is actually a reference to one of the facets of salvation, namely sanctification. Philippians 2.12, the Bible says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And I ask you this question, I hope you remember, what facet of salvation is the Apostle Paul talking about? The facet of? I just told that to you. <laughs> Sanctification. Sanctification. It's not justification. Although justification is the beginning of sanctification. It's not regeneration. Although regeneration is the beginning of sanctification. It is not conversion. Although conversion is the beginning of sanctification. But we're talking about this particular facet of Sanctification. So when the Apostle Paul says, work out your, sancti your salvation, is really saying, work out your sanctification. There needs to be a cooperation with the Holy Spirit in that we work salvation out. And one theologian said that the Greek verb rendered work out means to continually work to bring something to fulfillment or completion it cannot refer to salvation by works, but it does refer to the believer's responsibility, listen, for active pursuit of obedience in the process of sanctification, end quote. And so tonight, we are going to be talking about this active pursuit of obedience in the process of sanctification. There are... Two persons involved in, well, I should say, two beings involved in this process of sanctification. And the one being that we're going to be talking about tonight, the first, we're going to be talking about the being of God. And he has a role in, in our sanctification. And um, put your thinking caps on now. When I say God, what am I talking about? I am talking about the biblical God. I am talking about the Trinitarian God. Okay? God in three persons, blessed Trinity. And who are those, children? Who are those persons in the Trinity? We just had a discussion of this in the Taurus family, and so I'm looking at you right now. 
Who are these persons in the Godhead, in the Trinity? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. All three persons have, and I'm going to say now, roles in our sanctification. We're going to be talking about that in just a moment. I'm following the article set forth by Professor Wayne Grudem. He's written a book about this thick, and it's called Systematic Theology, Introduction to Christian Theology. So number one, if you're writing things down uh, tonight, write down God's role in sanctification. God's role in sanctification. Okay? Stay there in Philippians 2 because we're going to look at the following verse uh, there in verse number 13. Since sanctification is primarily a work of God, it is appropriate that Paul prays in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, may the God of peace himself sanctify you wholly. And so it is appropriate for, appropriate for him to invoke God uh, in our sanctification. And he is talking about God the Father here. One specific role of God the Father in sanctification is his, get this, um, fathers, can you guess? what God the Father's role is in our sanctification. We have fathers here that know God's the Father's role in our sanctification. How, how does God grow us? You have a hand raised. What was that? God the Father's role. Disciplining us. Very good. That's in Hebrews, Hebrews 12, 5 through 11. The process of disciplining us as his children. That's God the Father's process. That's his one specific role. And Paul tells the Philippians here, look at in verse 13 of Philippians 2, verse 13. For it is who? God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Oh, this is exciting. This is very interesting here. Why? Because this verse indicates for us a way in which God sanctifies the believers both by Causing us to want His will, right? And by giving us the power to perform His will. That's what this verse is teaching us, isn't it? Like, for it is God which worketh in you. God is in you, working in you, both to will. That is His, his will given in us. And to do of his good pleasure. So he is causing us to want his will. And he is also giving us the ability, the power to perform his will. And so it would be a great prayer for us to say, God, please give me a wanting. and Give me a desire for your will, Lord. And then... Once you give me your desire for your will, give me the ability to perform it. That's a great prayer, is it not? That is what God the Father does in us. So he is disciplining us, and then he's causing us to want his will, and he's giving us the power to do it. The author of Hebrews speaks of the role of the Father and the role of the Son in a familiar benediction. Now may the God of peace equip you with everything good that you may do His will, working in you that which is pleasing in His sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, we've talked about 
the role of God the Father. Let's look at quickly the role of God the Son. Who is God the Son? Jesus Christ. Uh, what is his role in sanctification? Well, number one, he earned our sanctification for us. Therefore, Paul could say that God made Christ to be our wisdom, our righteousness, and our sanctification, and our redemption. He earned our sanctification for us. Moreover, in the process of sanctification, Jesus is also, number two, our example, for we are to run the race of life, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And Peter t tells his readers that Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. And John says, he who says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Now, thirdly, the role of the Holy Spirit that is in our sanctification. The role of the Holy Spirit. It is specifically God, the Holy Spirit's job to produce holiness within us, to change us and to sanctify us, giving us greater holiness of life. Okay, let's look at um, a couple of verses here. Uh, let's look at Galatians 5.22. Galatians 5.22. It's very near to where you're at right now, just a, a few pages to the left. Galatians 5.22. Okay. The Apostle uh, Peter speaks of the sanctification of the Spirit. The Apostle Paul speaks of the sanctification by the Spirit. Okay, so this is God, the Holy Spirit's primary role, and that is to produce holiness within you, within us, uh, to sanctify us. It is the Holy Spirit who produces in us the fruit of the Spirit. Look at Galatians 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, that is self-control. Against such there is no law. When you put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, the Holy Spirit indwells in you and He starts to produce holiness within you and those come out in the characteristics that you exude. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, and so on and so forth. It is those character traits that are part of greater and greater sanctification. If we grow in sanctification, the Apostle Paul said, we walk by the Spirit and that we are led by the Spirit. That is, we are more and more responsive to the desires and promptings of the Holy Spirit of God in our life and character. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of holiness, and he produces holiness within us. So those are the roles of the Godhead, the Trinitarian God. And this is amazing. All of God is involved. All the persons in the Godhead are involved in our sanctification. And that's why in a couple of uh, sermons here that I have delivered to you, I was pretty uh, strong on God's priority for sanctification because it is all of the Trinity who are involved and engaged and are interested in our sanctification, and He prioritizes it. 
And the things that God allows in your life, um, even the spouse who is a thorn in your flesh, in your flesh, God allows that. Why? Because he wants to grow you and he's using that thorn in the flesh to grow you in holiness and sanctification. You see? All right. Now we come to your role in sanctification. To my role in sanctification. The role that we play in sanctification uh, is both passive and active. Passive in which we depend on God to sanctify us. But active in the sense that we are the ones striving and following and pursuing holiness, striving for that growth in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, striving to obey God and take the, the steps that will increase our sanctification. And so let's look at a few verses here. Number one, let's look at Romans chapter 6. Okay? We may call this the passive role. The passive role that we play in sanctification is uh, seen in many texts that encourage us to trust God or to pray and ask uh, that He sanctify us. Okay? And there's a key word here that I want to draw your attention to. Romans 6.13. Is everybody there? Say amen. amen. Romans 6.13 says this. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. What is the key word, you think, that is akin to passive, a passive role, our passive role? What's the key word that you see here? Yield, yielding. You see, when you're Coming to an on-ramp, perhaps, you see the yield sign and you yield. That is, you let others uh, on the main stream, on the main line of the freeway, pass first. You yield to them. In the same sense, we yield to God the Father who is disciplining us. We yield to the Lord Jesus Christ who has earned our sanctification for us. We yield to the Holy Spirit of God who is the one producing love, joy, peace, and long-suffering and self-control within us. We yield to them. We yield to the persons of the Trinity. In fact, uh, Romans uh, chapter 12, uh, quickly look at there, just a couple of pages to the right. Romans 12, a familiar passage of Scripture. Perhaps you have memorized it yourself. The Apostle Paul, beseeching us, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye yield, ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy Acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable worship, your reasonable service. And he tells the Roman Christians here uh, this, and by extension, us today. Paul realizes that uh, we are dependent on the Holy Spirit's work to grow in sanctification because he says... In Romans 8.13, if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. That is, passively yielding to the Holy Spirit of God. 
Unfortunately today, here's a caveat here, here's a warning here. Unfortunately today, this passive role in sanctification, this idea of yielding to God and trusting Him to work in us, to will and to work for His good pleasure, listen now, is sometimes so strongly emphasized that it is the only thing that people are, are, are being told about the path of sanctification. How many of you have heard of the phrase, let go and let God? Okay? That's the idea there, that sanctification is a passive thing. For the Christian, just let go and let God. It is given as a summary of how we live the Christian life. But this is a tragic distortion of the doctrine of sanctification. Why? Because that's only one side of our role. We think of this role like a coin. On the one side is a passive Role on the other side is an active role on our part. It only speaks of one half of the part we must play, and by itself, we lead Christians to become lazy and to neglect the active role that Scripture commands us to play in our own sanctification. And so we now go to that now. The active role which we are to play is indicated here by Romans 8.13. You're in Romans still, so go there. Romans 8.13. Okay, let's look at this. What is this saying? Let's unpack this for a little bit. Romans 8.13. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. So, through the Spirit, that is yielding to the Spirit, that is presenting our lives to the Spirit, we mortify the deeds of the body. Well, wait a minute now. It says here that if we yield to the Spirit, the Spirit is doing the mortification of the sins of our body. And then yet, it says, ye shall live. We are the one doing the living. We are the one actively doing the living. Here the Apostle Paul acknowledges that it is by the Spirit that we are able to do this. But he also says that we must do it. It is not the Holy Spirit who is commanded to put to death the deeds of the flesh. Who is? We are. We are the ones commanded this. And therefore, there needs to be an active obedience to that command similarly Paul tells the Philippians therefore my beloved as you have always obeyed so now not only as in my presence but much more in my absence work out your salvation with fear and trembling for God is at work in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure and the Apostle Paul encourages us to obey even more than um, the, the Philippians, they, the Apostle Paul, he, he, he told them to obey more. In his absence, than when he was um, present with them. Okay? And so, the Philippians are to work at this growth in sanctification and to do it solemnly and with reverence, with fear and trembling. For they are doing it in the presence of God himself. But, but there's more. Reason, the reason why they are to work, the reason why we are to work and to expect that our work will yield positive results is that God is at work in us. The prior and foundational work of God in sanctification means that our own work is empowered by God. You see, God is causing us to desire His will. And then He's the one giving us the ability to perform His will. 
And yet we are commanded to be the one doing that. Okay? So this is truly a cooperative work uh, that needs to be done in our lives. Okay? And there are many aspects to this active role that we are to play in sanctification. I want you to turn your Bibles now to Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, 14. Hebrews 12, 14. And uh, if there is somebody who could look up the ESV on this one, I will ask you a question about uh, how they translated it from the Greek. Uh, Hebrews 12, verse 14 says this. Follow peace with all men and what? Holiness. So you're supposed to follow peace, and then you're supposed to follow holiness. Why? Because without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Without holiness, without this sanctification, without this um, growth in the Lord, without this separation from the world, without being separated unto God. You cannot see God. In, in other words, without salvation, really. You cannot see the Lord. But I'm interested in how did the ESV translate the word follow? Strive. Strive. Isn't that an active Activity, <laughs> isn't it? It's to strive, to pursue, uh, to, to, to go after, to follow after. It requires your active role in that. We're supposed to strive for holiness. We are to do this because without it, no one will see the Lord. In another text, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, we are to abstain from immorality and so obey the will of God. Again, to obey the will of God requires active part on you and on me. And then it says that the will of God is our sanctification. And we're supposed to obey that will of God. John also says that those who hope to be like Christ when he appears will actively work at purification in this life. 1 John 3, 3 says, Everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself. Wait, wait a minute. I thought it was the Holy Spirit's job to make me holy, to make me pure. Yes, it is the Holy Spirit's job to do that, but you cooperate as well. Amen? This kind of striving for obedience to God and for holiness may involve great effort on our part, for Peter tells his readers to make every effort to grow in character traits that accord with godliness. In the last two minutes that we have tonight, I want you to blurt out to me what kinds of activities that you do which actively strives for sanctification. What kinds of efforts should we be following after? What kinds of efforts should we be pursuing after? What kinds of activities should we be striving at to get at holiness and to grow in sanctification in the Lord? Okay, we have two minutes left. Who will be the first one? What? Read the Bible. Read the Bible. 
reading the Bible. Do we have a plan in our local church for a Bible reading plan? Yes, we do. It's on the back of our bulletin, our church bulletin. And it's there every week. What else? Prayer. Prayer. Do we have prayer here in this church? We absolutely do. We provide it every time that the doors are open in this church. We have prayer going on. We ask people for prayer requests. And we pray right away. We are cultivating a church culture of prayerfulness in this church. These are things that we strive after and follow after and pursue after. These are the means for our growth. What else? Sharing the gospel. Do we share the gospel? Do we share the gospel personally? Do we share the gospel as an organized body of believers? Do we have a schedule in the church that as a corporate body we go out into our neighborhoods and attempt to open up conversations of the gospel? Yes, we do. And we have all kinds of tools here uh, for you to be able that on a personal basis. We have them available on our gospel a rack in the foyer. Oh, church, these are the means of our growth. What else? I heard somebody said fellowship. That's a great means to grow in the Lord, to grow in our sanctification. Do we have fellowship? Not only on Sunday mornings before church and after church, not only on Sunday nights before uh, the Sunday evening church and after Sunday evening church, this should be going on all throughout the week. Call up somebody. Hey, brother so-and-so. Hey, sister so-and-so. Let's get together. Let's talk about how your week is going. Is there anything I can pray for you? Let's do this over coffee. Let's do this over a burrito or something like that. And do this thing of sanctification, this fellowship that we have. We ought to be at uh, that community. We ought to be that body of believers that strive for holiness. And fellowship is one of the means for growth. What else? Singing praises, Singing praises unto the Lord. Is any one of you uh, despondent or in distress? Let them sing. That's what the Bible says. That's how you combat um, distress and despondency. Sing unto the Lord. Call up somebody on the phone. Hey, brother, I am really despondent. Can you sing with me on the phone? What else? Tithing. Tithing. Tithing is another uh, means of growth. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse and try me, test me. If I will not open the door of heaven and pour you out a blessing, oh, that is a great means for growth as well. What else? Fasting, fasting is not feasting, but it is uh, uh, refraining from uh, from from food or, or drink or or TV shows, refraining from doing that, but focusing on prayer and uh, focusing on on that which really burdens you and you want the Lord to listen to you and therefore you uh, fast and pray. What else? Serving. Serving others. Serving uh, other families like, like what you're doing to me, right? You're serving my family. You're ministering to my family. Uh, uh, I'm encouraged by that and I'm so thankful for that and it, it grows me. And you are uh, being um, helped in your Christian growth as well. What else? Submitting to the Word of God. Whenever you read uh, the Word of God and it tells you something, oh, do not let it pass you by. And you, when you're prompted to uh, do something by the Holy Spirit of God, uh, do it. That's how you grow. What else? I, I heard something over here. Church attendance, thank you, dear sister. 
That is, this is, this is great. Why? Because, because a lot of people are neglecting it. A lot of people are neglecting it. So much, it's interesting to me that as Hebrews obviously was written in the first century, they already had that problem back, you know, 2,000 years ago. And today you look around and where are, where's so-and-so? Where's, uh, church attendance is a means of grace for us to grow in sanctification. What else? What, what is that thing that we do every month, once a month on the first Sunday of the month? Communion. Communion, partaking of the elements of uh, the body and blood of Jesus Christ and, and meditating on that and reflecting on that and uh, be uh, touched by what the Lord Jesus Christ and in your emotions and your entire being as you're thinking about his death, burial, and resurrection. It's a means of growth, a means of grace for us to grow. I think um, you have mentioned all of that, and if you can think of anything else, let me know. And we, we here at uh, Riverside Baptist Church, we're, we're striving, aren't we? We're designing all of our life and ministries to provide each and every one of you these means of growth in the Lord. Question for you. Are there any shortcuts to this? Is there a magic pill out there somewhere that we can buy and say, this green pill right here will increase your growth? Emmett, if you take this once a day, by the end of the week, you will grow in sanctification. Just pop it in. Here's $5 for one pill. Right? No, there's no shortcuts. There's no magic pills. All right? But it, we are simply to do this repeatedly, to give ourselves to the old-fashioned, time-honored means of Bible reading and meditation, prayer, worship, witnessing, Christian fellowship, self-discipline. Okay? Last question I have for you. In the scriptures, did you know that the means of growth, the means of growth in sanctification are to be done in a corporate process, in a corporate setting? The scripture teaches us that, needs, that this needs to be done. There's no lone Christian. There's no lone ranger Christian out there. And that is why we need to emphasize what uh, one, one of you said, uh, church attendance. Church attendance is crucial in the process of sanctification. It's usually to be done in a corporate setting. Um, I told you to go to Hebrews. Uh, Hebrews 10. Let's end here tonight. Let's end here tonight in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25. It is something that happens in community. It is something that happens within the corporate body of believers. Look at Hebrews 10, 24. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. The word consider there, we get our English term to study or to do diligent research. <laughs> Have you considered your sister, your brother in Christ? You know them. You study them. Uh, this can be used of a, uh, uh, a googly-eyed um, young man looking at a 
a beautiful young lady and says, I'm going to know everything about that young person there because I, I like her. I'm going to consider her. I'm going to study her. I'm going to... I'm gonna, I want to know what her favorite color is and her favorite uh, things to do so that I can, uh, you know, get her attention. This is, this is really interesting. Let us consider. And it's, it's used here for, for the believers. Let's consider one another. Let's study one another. And then to provoke and to love and to good works. To provoke there is to literally uh, find a button to push. To provoke them and to love and to good work. What, what buttons do you have to provoke you to, so that you will love? You will show forth love and you, were, you will be motivated to do good work. This is what we should do. Then this is done not by a lone ranger Christian out there, but in a community setting, a corporate setting. And not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. It just makes sense that the apostle, uh, whoever wrote the book of Hebrews, I almost said the apostle Paul, and more than likely it was the apostle Paul, but nonetheless, he said, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. It just makes sense that he would do that, that he would say that. Why? Because this needs to be done in a corporate setting. And like I said, 2,000 years ago, people have already neglected the assembling of themselves together because that was the manner of them. But we need to be exhorting one another, that is, encouraging one another. And really, it's a little bit stronger than encourage, exhort, okay? A little bit stronger than just to encourage, but to exhort, to, like I said before, to, to push your button. And so much the more as you, day, as you see the day approaching. Oh, I hope you've been helped by this. I've certainly been refreshed in my mind by this study. And so may the Lord uh, impress upon your hearts the need for our, yes, passive obedience and, 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 and uh, more so our active obedience in our role in the sanctification process. All right? Let's um, pray, and then we'll pick up uh, next Lord's Day, a couple of Lord's Days from today, uh, on the homework that I gave you. I did not forget about the homework I gave you, and so we will come back on that, all right? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you. Thank you for your word. Oh, Lord, let us awake to our responsibility to cooperate with the Trinitarian God uh, to be active in our role in sanctification. Help us, Lord, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's all stand. And let me give you the benediction tonight. May the things that I've said from this pulpit May the things that I've done in my life as you've seen me and my family be not only a blessing to you, not only an example to you, but you would seek uh, to imitate those things as I imitate Christ. The Lord bless you. You're dismissed.